say it again. If I hear another real estate person tell me that their retirement plan is their real estate, is their house that they're going to sell, is their rental income that they're going to get, I'm like, please, child, please. What's up, landlords? Welcome to the second episode of this mini series, the Women in Real Estate Summit mini series within the Better Than Success podcast. So if you are new to this podcast, to this mini series, just to give you guys some context, we are doing the fourth Women in Real Estate Summit on November 11th, 2023 in Philadelphia. And because this lineup of women that are gonna be speaking at this conference is gonna be so rich and so fire, I am doing a mini series interviewing these women because I want you guys, when you get to the summit, I want you to have context for who these women are and what they've done so that you can get more bang for your buck at the event. This event is going to be crazy, but you know what? I'm not even going to try to sell you on it right now. One thing real quick, the audio in this episode is kind of messed up. So the first episode and the second episode, the audio is kind of messed up. I didn't know. I shot them on the same day. I didn't know the audio was going to be messed up until after the fact. But the content in this interview is so fire. It's crazy. It's my mic sounds a little muffled. It's not terrible to listen to. It's totally fine. I'm just in the perfectionist, so I need to explain it. That's it. You will be fine. Trust me when I tell you. <laughs> I don't do much of the talking anyway. My guest does. That's all that matters. Her mic sounds great. Let me read off her bio. Lindsay Smith, CEO and founder of Lindsay Smith, the Agent Inc., is a respected insurance figure with 13 plus years in financial services. As a licensed life and health insurance broker, she's dedicated to educating and raising awareness. Lindsay authored Creating Wealth Through Life Insurance, a highly informative book. In 2020, she launched a mentorship program that assists fellow agents. Lindsay holds a business administration bachelor's degree from Baruch College, 2004, and is a member of the Million Dollar Roundtable and the National African American Insurance Association. Clients trust her financial expertise to safeguard their family's future and goals. She's proud to serve and help her clients succeed. So, okay, let's hop right into this. Everyone, a welcome to the stage, Lindsay Smith. Thank you so much for having me, Nicole. Super excited to have you here. Yes. So, Lindsay, I just read off your bio. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself in your own words? Okay. So, you know, when you got to speak about yourself, you got to figure out what's important that you think is important. But anyway, my name is Lindsay Smith, and I have been in the insurance industry for 13 years. I started in 2010. The funny backstory behind me is that I used to be in entertainment. I actually used to work. I used to intern at Vibe Magazine back in the day, if any of you guys know what that is. Then from there, I actually started a kids' clothing line called Tiny Pants with my co-partner. Um, from there, I ended up being in fashion. I used to do something called celebrity placement, which was marketing. And then I finally got into what I went to college for, which was finance, and I've been in financial services ever since, since 2010. Um, so I've been kind of like a serial entrepreneur. But this is where my passion fell into. Um, always been really interested in learning how to grow money, learning how to keep money. Um, and so especially coming for the year, the earlier years, being in a business where we were just spending money crazy in the whole entertainment side of things. Um, getting into this financial business was something that I got to learn and be able to bring it back to the people that I knew and just my friends, family, and be able to help people with their finances moving forward. So that's where I am now. I am, I also, obviously I'm an author of a book creating wealth through life insurance. I mentor agents. So anybody who's an agent looking to be in the financial business, um, I'm mentoring agents. Also, I have an agency where I bring agents under me and I train them and get them prepared to be able to go out and make sure that the people in the community, the people across the nation have life insurance or 
fully prepared financially with everything across the board when it comes to finances. Why don't you tell us a little bit about, right, like you made a lot of transitions um, in the beginning part of your career when you decided to become an agent and like say, okay, you know, I'm going to go back to my roots. I'm going to go back to where I came here for. What was that decision like? And talk to us about just like, what was your initial vision as well when you first decided, okay, I'm going to be a, I'm going to go and be an insurance agent. So if I could be completely honest, it was around 2008, 2009, where things just was not what they needed to be. And um, being in the industry of marketing, remember there's an industry of marketing, the way they look at it, sales is always first. So because I was doing the marketing, that basically what they used to do is pay me to get clothes on like celebrities. So that became something that they, when the company started cutting back, they're like, wait, we need to cut back. Money's tight. You know, the market had crashed. So and- when you did that job, that was, you did that job for yourself. That's like an independent. Right. So basically the companies would reach out to me and they knew I had all the connections with the different celebrities. So they would pay me to get their clothes on them for like award shows, for magazines, things like that. Um, And I also had a styling agency, which is how it kind of intertwined. My stylists were styling all of these different celebrities. So it was simple for me to get them to wear the clothes. So when the recession happened, everything fell back, (laughs) right? And so what I wanted to do was get into a business that was recession proof. I had got a call from a company and they were saying, hey, you can come here, we'll train you, we'll teach you everything you need to know. I don't like to speak the company, right? But um, we'll train you, we can teach you everything you need to know, and you can get your license, and then, you know, you can get started. So, and what I liked about it was... That operates like that. Huh? We're like three companies that operates like that during that time period. So, so you already know. <laughs> um, it's a major company. Right. I, I don't like to speak their name because, you know, they got issues of you speaking their name. So I was with them for 10 years. And so basically with this company, it w- what I liked was I'm coming from being an entrepreneur, being able to make whatever I wanted to make based off of how many people I dealt with. I've always had that mindset. I've always been a person that instead of taking the safe option of getting a salary, I was always the person that, no. If you give me the opportunity to have no limit on how much money that I can make based off of what I do, I'm always going to beat the salary. So I got into this business because it was no ceiling. It was it was you can do whatever you want to do. You can get in. You could do life insurance. You could be a financial advisor. You could do disability, health insurance, whatever it is you wanted to sell. You could do group business, whatever. Um, and so I got into the business and I got, I had got my securities licenses and I kind of focused more on life, health, disability, long-term care, those type of things. But because I did really well, I got sent all across the nation to all of these different conferences where they were teaching and it wasn't a lot of people that look like us and definitely not women because this is really a white male business so, you know, I was the oddball and I was in there in my pink dress instead of my black and blue suit with my French nails. I had pink nails, you know, and that comes off very weird in the financial business, especially at these kind of companies that are very conservative. And so I was learning all of these things that I was like, I want to bring this information back to us. All of these ways that they were setting up their money for retirement, for now investing, real estate, um, all of these different conversations we were having that we were like not in the room, you know, and all these other cultures were there. It just wasn't us. Mm -hmm. And so I had said that what I wanted to do was eventually branch off from being with them um, and be able to deal with whoever I wanted to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for 10 years and eventually I wanted to get on social media and start really kind of teaching our people about insurance because brochures and all of those type of things, they don't speak to us. We need some more layman's terms 
you know, put it into perspective based off of what we're dealing with and the kind of mishaps our families are having. And I wasn't able to do that being with this company because they regulated our social media. So I had to leave there and I took a leap of faith. And I said, I'm going to leave there and I'm going to start my own agency. I'm going to be a broker. And what that means, guys, is that means I'm able to sell any company. So I'm able to broker to any company which best suits my clients. This way, I don't have to say I'm only selling this one company and what they have. I can sell whatever makes sense for the individual. Um, but that's how I, I transitioned. Um, and it's been great. It's a great business. When did you make the transition? That was in 2010. Oh, 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 okay. So you, wow, you are OG, OG. <laughs> That was in 2010 when I went from being in that industry to moving into the financial services industry. Got it. Okay. No, I mean from when you let when you decided to be your own. Oh, 2020. Got it. Okay. 2020. Mm -hmm. 2020. I left, but before I left, so even when you're in a captive company, before I left, once you had certain numbers and you were three years in, you were able to sell other companies, but they regulated the products. So you couldn't sell any product. It had to be a product that they were okay with. But I still, I started selling outside maybe five years into the business, maybe 2014, 2015, I started selling outside. So I was familiar with the broker side. Um, but yeah, I full, I went full. I left it completely. I love it. So talk to me about from a holistic standpoint, how you can better service your community, your audience, being your own being your own broker versus when you're under this this brokerage with you know very restrictive things that you can do. Talk to us about how how you can better craft needs for your 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 customers. Okay, so really when. I'm my own broker. I am able to really talk to a client, ask them what their goals are. Um, and we di we dig deep. It's not simple goals. I want to know, you know, what's your plans as far as are you buying real estate? Do you have a lot of debt? Do you have children? Do you plan on having children? Are you married? Are you planning on leaving your assets to your husband or are you or your spouse? Um or are you leaving it to your children? You know, because everybody doesn't have the same idea in their head by who they want to leave their legacy to. So you have to ask these questions. Um, also, I'm talking about health events. I've seen a lot of people lose their finances behind not planning for long-term care events, not planning for times when your income is less. So really what I'll do is I'll do a holistic planning with them and I'm able to ask them questions about everything. And now we can look at anything. We can look at annuities. We can look at disability. We can look at long-term care. Um, you know, we can look at investing. We can look at all the different things that require you to have a financially strong structure. Versus, uh, versus when you were at this brokerage or if any agent is at a brokerage. So yeah. when I was with... The other company, I could do all of those things with their products. So now I'm able to say, hmm, maybe you don't want to spend spend thirty percent more because the company name is X Y Z, and I can now put you with this company that has the same product. It's just not this company name, and it's thirty percent less. Still great company. Still quadruple A. Still 6% dividend, it's still, right? But it's not company, this company's name. And so it's less. Mm -hmm. Or I'm also able now to sell you annuity from a bunch of different companies. So some companies have better interest rates than others. Some companies have better riders than others. Um, some, some companies, just the structure of their entire policy is just different. And now I have that opportunity to really individualize the policies to a customer. Whereas before it was like, I kind of had to fit you into their options. Now it's like, I'm listening to exactly what you want. And I'm saying, hmm, company X for that, company Y for that, company Z for that. 
we get you the best scenario for the most of cost of cost effective pricing. And I'm still going to make sure it's top quality. I'm still not going to deal with the rinky dink companies either way, but it's not, it doesn't all have to be under this one umbrella. And that's what it kind of needed to be when I was there. A lot of stuff just had to be under this one umbrella because they were my broker dealer. So I had to do that business under them. So what you're saying is don't work with agents that work specifically for one company. <laughs> Use an agent that's independent. If you know better, then you do better. No, so you know, I I don't like to say that in its entirety because two of the captive companies that I do know, and I'm not going to speak on their names, right? But two of the captive companies have a very large product suite. Mm -hmm. So even though they may not be able to, the agent may not be able to sell them outside. It's so many options. You probably can find, you could definitely find what you need and it still be good for you. It's just that you don't get that option for anything. But I will say a lot of my colleagues that are still with these particular captive companies, they have their own business on the side where they can sell outside business limitedly, right? It's a limit. You know, because again, like I told you, there's certain products that the company will not let you sell. So you can't sell those, you know, but yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's better to go with a broker. That's it definitely is. But listen, there's some brokers that still are only able to sell certain products just because the company they're brokering with only has maybe three companies or four companies. You understand? So you can still have a agent that says, hey, I'm a broker, but the companies that they're brokered with are trash. Mm. You know, so you 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 kind of need to really have a conversation with them about the companies that you're interested in. Are you looking for top tier companies? Some people are not. Some people's budgets is not not in the space where they want that type of company. They may want a B-level company. It's cheaper, for sure. But, you know, the product quality may not be the same. You learn something new every day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know this. I So I, I got insurance stuff long before knowing you. So, you know, if I knew, if I knew you, you know. <laughs> but I got some insurance stuff a long time ago. And um, luckily, that person was a broker. And so I... Like I'm, I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I don't even want to look under the hood at this point because that'll send me on a whole wild goose chase of <laughs> trying to figure, and try to right my wrong uh, if it is wrong. But that person was a broker, so I feel good about that choice. Okay, so let's stay on task. I got two things I want to talk about. One, I do want to talk a little bit about that transition and how what that was like for you making the transition from going from that particular firm to being your own broker, um, how, did that, how did you handle that? Like we talked a little bit about betting on yourself, mm -hmm. um, but how did you handle that? Because, you know, part. you're on their own all the time and you can never have enough advice about going on your own. So let's talk about that experience. So I'm going to have to be honest with you guys. I contemplated for literally three years before I left, like I was on the bridge of leaving this company for years. Um, and of course, when you're with a captive company, it comes with some benefits, right? You have your 401k, you have your health insurance, you have these bonuses that the company's giving, they send you on trips, all of these different things that they do. So it does make it hard. It's not an easy transition to say, but what you always, I think just in life, Sometimes you may have to take a couple of steps back for you really to take that leap forward. And so I think I, the bet on yourself, that is a key statement that I had to keep telling myself that I know that I would be able to make way more money if I left, because now I will have the opportunity to work with more people. I will have the opportunity to not 
only work with more people, but I'll be able to give them better service. And I will be able to have people that I can then mentor. There was a lot of things I couldn't do. I really couldn't mentor agents through their platform unless it was for them, right? They had me mentoring agents for them, for their company. But I didn't want to do that because I had to abide by their rules and how they wanted the agents to it. And I'm like, that's really doesn't work for us, you know? So I think that betting on myself was big. I had to put a strategy together. I literally had notes and notes and notes about what I was going to do when I left. I started to kind of put things in place before I fully left. I started getting things set up as far as my social media is concerned, how I was going to market myself. Um, and I just started the transition with my clients, letting them know, listen, now I'm going to be a broker and I'm going to be able to service your needs because I knew that since I was a captive company, they were going to take the clients I had and they were going to give them to another agent at their company. So I knew I was really having this kind of start off new and taking a fresh start. And so I think what really helped me was I knew that I'm the person who did, had all those clients. That was me who was writing 200 people a year or 100 people a year, right? That was me who was doing the premium that I was doing. That wasn't the company. That was me. And so, and I did that with all the restrictions that they had. So imagine with not having those restrictions, what happened? And I left and I kid you not, in less than six months, I made more money than I had made there the previous year. Because also when you leave and you do broker business, my commission is higher because they're not paying my 401k. They're not paying my pension. They're not paying my health insurance. My commission is way higher. And because I had numbers, I was able to negotiate with the IMOs what I wanted my commission to be, what level I needed it to be at the highest level because I could bring in the numbers. So I felt that it was a transition. It was times where I was like, tag, their system was easier. Their, this, you know, you always in hindsight will say, well, this was better, but you always have to remember to not go back. Funny thing. I just went to the Sarah Jakes concert in Texas. Oh, well, I wanted to go so bad. All I have to say, you had to be in the room. It was different. It was different. And one of the things she spoke about, which goes to talk about this, and actually her husband um, did a whole speech, did, did a whole session on um, taking it to the next level. This is your moment. And one of the things he said was that in the book of Esther, how you, they ba basically, they were in a bad situation and God told them that they were going to get moved into a new situation. And everybody was so excited to move to the new situation. They get into the new situation that God places them in. And they realized they don't have no food, no water, all these things that they thought that they were going to have. And they were like, well, why wouldn't we just stay where we were at? But where they were at was horrible. Where they at was horrible, but where they were at now wasn't great. And so what he said is that you got to be willing to go through that part where it's not great, where you can look in hindsight and see that that was horrible, but because this doesn't seem great, you're starting to say, hey, I want to go back there. And really, if you just stick this area out, greatness is on the other side. Greatness is on the other side. And so I think in business, a lot of times when you transition, that's exactly what happens. You were in a situation that you weren't happy with. You, you wanted it, you either wanted to change, you could have hated it, you wanted to do something new. And when you switch out of the situation, the in-between situation is never great. That transition is rough. And it's in a space where you, you start to ask yourself, well, maybe that situation wasn't so bad. But it was. It was. When you were there, you knew it was bad. But because you're moved into a situation that's not great, you're like, mm, I don't know. 
But if you don't stick it out, you don't get to the greatness. You don't get to see all of what you worked so hard for. If you just keep pushing, you keep pushing, you keep pushing. Then when you get to the other side, it's like, yes, this is what I knew it was going to be. But you won't get there. And this happens in real estate. This happens in every aspect of your life, relationships, real estate, business, everything. Just think about times when people get in a situation when they purchase a house their first time and they really didn't know what the heck they was doing. And they're in that gray area and they're like, dang, maybe I shouldn't have get involved. Everybody told me that I should, but I shouldn't because I should have stayed over here. I was happy over here. You're losing money here because you didn't get your education that you needed. But when you get out of this situation and you finally close this door, it was a learning lesson. And now when you buy that next house, you now know all the things that you don't want to do ever again. And the next situation would be better. But you know what people do? Oh, man, you said so much. Oh, my goodness. But you know what people do? What? People turn back around from when they get to that gray area. But also specifically with real estate, what they do is they get into that first deal and it doesn't go according to plan. A lot of people, not most people, maybe, I don't know, it could be most people, but a lot of people get burnt and be like, I'm not doing it again. I got burnt. I'm not doing it again. And they will say that real estate, real estate is not for them. They will exit out this. I did. I tried that investment. I'm not going to do it. I think that happens so often in every business. Real estate is a really good example of it because a lot of times you got to lose money in that gray area because you didn't have that education. You didn't get with the right team. You had the wrong contractor. You had some of the hard money. You didn't, you didn't have an exit plan. Period. It was just a lesson that you needed to learn. And sometimes education comes in the form of experience and sometimes it costs. Like experience can cost you money. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I know. I had two... Was it two bad situations before finally things were panning out? And even the last situation, the pan out situation came with some nonsense too. Um, but I didn't give up on real estate because I knew I've made so much money from different real estate transactions. I'm like, just because this one situation didn't work like it was planned or it took longer than it was planned, it can't be the end. It can't be the end. You, I learned so much that at this point, I don't have those issues anymore because now I know all of these other things that I didn't know before. Real quick, this will only take a sec, but I promise you, you'll be so valuable. I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors for the Women in Real Estate Summit 2023, MB Capital Solutions. You guys may have seen on the YouTube channel, I do a lot of content with them. They get our members unsecured business credit to help them get their real estate deals done. So you combine business credit with hard money loans. This is how you can do deals for $0 out of pocket. Does your business need to be seasoned, super seasoned and been around for years and years and years? Absolutely not. But they have gotten our members almost $4 million in unsecured business credit. I promise you, I promise you it is well worth the call. So what I need you to do is hit MB Capital up, mbcapitalsolutions.com. Um, I'll post their information down in the description. If you're listening on the podcast, it'll be in the description of the podcast and tell them that Nicole from BTS sent you, you will get a discount on their services. So if you need some business credit, you need some credit, you need some ex extra capital, hit MB up and tell Nicole sent you. You know, so this bring, brings it back to that original statement when you keep talking about back on yourself. And so when we were talking about this earlier behind in backstage, right? Before we <laughs> record, um, I was like, I had something I wanted to share, but I wanted to save it for when we, when we press record. And I didn't think about this until you said it, because you were in a deep, pensive state where you were like, I didn't think about, you know, that you got to bet on yourself. It's something you got to do. But the reality is betting on yourself is a mindset. Mm -hmm. And it you made me think about this moment when I was fresh out of college, fresh, fresh out of college. I remember I was with my dad. We were standing in like a supermarket or something. And I was just standing there just complaining. And just about like, I'm in debt. I was like in 60 grand worth of debt, which is nothing 
for college now. I don't even know. I thought that was like so much money. Yeah, not for now. Now that they be in four hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. Actually, oh, this is this is crazy. This whatever. That's neither here nor there. So I was saying to my dad, like, oh my goodness, I, I, I I'm in debt, and like, I don't, you know, I get to these jobs. Da, 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 da. And he said something to me. He said um, something along the lines of like. If you're going to go in debt for something, it should be for yourself. Basically, like you got to bet on yourself. And when he said that to me, it clicked. Something clicked in my mind to make me always from that moment forward move in a way that no matter what, I'm going to bet on me. Mm-hmm. And for well, any circumstance, I don't care what it is. Mm-hmm. I don't care what, the, what, what, what it says. I don't care what the writing on the wall says. I'm always going to default to I'm going to bet on me. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a mindset because I think that sometimes people don't move forward or they're not achieving their goals or they're not gaining any traction because they don't have the mindset of I'm going to bet on me. They always default to as opposed to us defaulting to like, hey, I know I can get this done. Mm-hmm. Default to, hey, I can't do it. Mm-hmm. And I don't get it twisted. Sometimes I feel like, you know, we all have those moments where we're like, I can't do it. But the reality is betting on yourself is a mindset. Mm -hmm. It's not just an action. It's not just a one-time decision. It's a mindset of saying, no matter what I do, I'm going to bet on me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing about that is that... um, The betting on yourself comes with so much steps, so many stages to it. You know, it's levels to betting on yourself. When we're talking about betting on yourself, we're not talking about putting yourself in a bad situation. You got to have some educating education to that betting on yourself. I'm not telling you to go get involved in a business that you've never been in before. You know nothing about, and you're about to put up a hundred K and you never did. I'm, I'm saying betting on yourself on something smart. (laughs) I'm saying something that you know that you've prepared for, right? So when we say that preparation is going to basically get us to success because preparation, we're going to be prepared for that moment in time where we get an opportunity, we're ready to go. I've been preparing for it all of these years so that when the opportunity came, I was already ready. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to get ready. So when we're saying bet on yourself, we're saying if this is something that you've been doing, this is something you've been studying, this is something that you have been preparing for. When the opportunity comes, yes, bet on yourself. Yes, invest in yourself. Yes, find your last dollar to bet on yourself. Don't spend your last dollar on something you've never done before. And I don't mean when I say never done, because at every level, it's something you haven't done Mm -hmm. because that's why it's the next level. So we're always scared to go to the next level. It's a very uncomfortable space every time you level up because you've never been there before. So, of course, it's uncomfortable. But when I say bet on yourself, please don't take that as (laughs) bet on yourself on something that you know nothing about. Mm -hmm. Get be prepared for it. That's part of betting on yourself is saying, hey, I know how, like, success is a habit, right? This, you know, this whole thing is all about mindset and habits, right? So success is a habit. So if you know you're going to bet on yourself, you know, you know what? I know the steps to make this thing work. Mm -hmm. Preparing myself, that means educating myself. This is why I'm going to bet on myself because I know the steps. I know how to do this. I know what to do. I know cut the fat. I know, you know, ain't no going out. I know it ain't none of this. It ain't none of that. It ain't. I can. I know what I got to do when I got to lock in. So therefore, I will bet on myself because I know how to lock in. Right now, I'm in a lock in moment, mm-hmm. and I will bet every dime on the, on the cold locked in. <laughs> People asking me, "Do you call me?" Like you always busy. Not. It's not even that I'm busy. I do not even be busy. It's not even. It's not. Even, not even busy in the way that you think it is. I am just so locked in because I know the play. I know when I need to get something done. I know it's 
you know, up at 4 30, get my work done, da -da -da -da, go to the gym, take, da -da -da, take my son to school, come back, sit at my desk. Da -da 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 -da. I don't got time to be chit chatting. I'm betting on myself right now. I know the play and I'm run. I've done this play. I ran it. I'm running it again. So it's all about knowing the steps mm -hmm. and how to prepare yourself. Yep. No. I mean, you really hit it on the nose and and it's funny how you said about the being busy and not having time. I think when you're on your mission that you're so focused on the things that you have to do, like everything in your life is aligned with that goal that a lot of things fall between the cracks, things that are not needed fall between the cracks. And some people could look at it as you're busy, you know what I'm saying? No, it's not that. It's everything i'm doing is something that goes towards this goal that i'm that i'm trying to reach and i know i'm going to reach it but i can only reach it if i take these steps every single day for me to get there so i totally and that that tunnel vision is real but when you come out that tunnel it's like yes right because you hit it on the nose because it's done um so i love that and i know I know that feeling. It's like when you wake up before you go to sleep, every second you're thinking, you're in your phone, you're on your notes, you're like, oh, I had an idea. Let me put that in there. Matter of fact, let me see how I could put that idea into play. Who do I need to call? What do I need to start? What do I need to write? So everything is aligning with that. And I think that in any business, I don't care what you're doing, your mindset has to align with your goals. Just like in working out, you can't say, and I'm number one for this, please. You can't say you want to lose 10 pounds and tonight I go out to eat and I'm going to eat a half a plate of rice. I'm going to have steak. I'm going to have an appetizer. I'm going to have soda. I'm going to have liquor. Uh, what 10 pounds do I want to lose? I want to gain it. My actions are saying gain 10 pounds. So sometimes it's not really about what you say. That's why you hear people say, I may not speak about what my goals are until it happens. Because it's not about what you say. I could tell, Nicole, I could tell you today I want to make $10 billion. Okay, okay well, what, what are you going to do? You're going to have to make some changes. Right. If you're going to make $10 billion, there's going to have to be some real changes in your life about what you're going to do and how you're going to do it and how you're going to move to get to that. Because everybody says they want to be a millionaire. I want to do real estate. I want to be a millionaire. What does that look like? Right. How many houses does that mean you had to buy and flip? How many houses did you have to buy and hold? How, how many buildings? How many properties you got? First, let's start. How many properties you got to look at? How many got? How many going to put offers on? How many right. investors are? Or are they putting on offers? Do you even know how to find properties? Right. Let's start. Let's take it all the way back. Where's your money coming from? Well, hold, on, hold, on, hold, on, hold on, let's take let's take it even more back before that because this is a conversation that nobody wants to have. Mm -hmm. Look, you have to take an audit of what you are doing today and have a serious, honest conversation with yourself and say, these things that I'm doing today is getting me the life that I have right now. Because sometimes people don't want to let go of their habits that they think are good. Mm -hmm. They're so attached to those habits. Mm -hmm. The reality is those habits aren't good. They're not, they're not for the goal. They're for what you have today. Case mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Example of that. Yes. Which is said that this is why they say you got to change the habits and start having the mindset before you actually get to the goal. You know how they sometimes say for women, of course, this is what they say this. You got to act like the wife before you become the wife. Because the man that you're going to get has everything to do with the behavior that you currently have. So they say you need to have those actions of being a wife now. You can't be all over here confused and this, that, and the third, and then looking for a man who's ready to settle. So it's the same thing in business. It's the same thing with us getting out of debt. Before you're getting out of debt. Your habits got to change. You can't be just paying off the debt and keeping the same habit because you're going to get back in debt after you pay this debt off. Or you might be building more debt while you're paying it off. So the goal is I got to change the habits. I'm going to cut back the bills. I'm going to cut back the spending. I'm going to only spend X percentage 
even though I make this. I'm, I have to change that, get in that mindset. And now I'm paying off the debt, but I'm also, I have changed the habit. So when the debt is paid off, the habits have already changed. Now I'm investing my money that I'm saving, right? Now I'm buying real estate. Now I'm starting a business. Now I'm making more money and I still have my bills here, all the way down here. Because I have practiced the habits of not going back into debt. So I think what you said, that makes total sense. We have to change our habits now for the life that we want later. For everything. If you want to get in real estate, it requires a lot of discipline. It's a lot of discipline. It's a lot of discipline. It's time. It's money. And obviously, you also need to have the education so that you can see an opportunity or you can see some garbage and be like, eh, mm -mm, that don't look like what I want to be a part of. <laughs> what you say? Mm, that sounds too much like wrong, right? <laughs> so, so I think that we need to start paying attention because people get in these stupid deals. And I hear people telling me all the time, oh, somebody told me that I could just jump on. They're going to pay me 30%. I'm going to just give them my money. I said, okay, so how are they paying you 30%? I mean, I just need to know how they got to 30% and how you're going to get to 30%. Because you don't do nothing. You just give them money. They're going to work the deal out. And they're going to give you 30% of their money. How would they know their profit margin is 30%? How much? How much? How much? What deal? <laughs> How much is they make? How much are they making off the deal? That right. right, and then they gave you thirty percent. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I and they did all the work. The contract is this, that they did the day to day, and you sat over there. And you got thirty percent of your money. That sounds too much like wrong. <laughs> it sounds like your money is gonna go towards their project, and you gonna they're gonna come back with a sob story about oh things didn't work out right. That's what that sounds like, and that's exactly what happened all the time. And so I just think it's an education piece. Um, and I think because people are online and there's so many mixed stories online, think about the people who are online, who's like, I made a million dollars yesterday. Okay. Well, let's get some more backstory about that million dollars that you made yesterday. How long have you been in the business? How much did you put in the business? How much money did you lose before we got to this point? I need some backstory because I, I'm not excited or for the million dollars you made yesterday because I don't know what you did. When we met at Matt's thing and I was I was on stage, I talked about the math ain't math. You got to back into <laughs> the math ain't math. Yes, I, you did say that. <laughs> you got to back into these numbers, especially when you see a lot of these people. Social media is a can be a full-time job. And so like, especially if these people are talking about, oh, I'm doing these quadrillion dollar deals. Quadrillion dollar deal makers don't got enough time to make five and six posts a day. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm oh. telling you, Lord. I'm letting you know all my mentors, the gajillion dollar deal makers. You know they got to get me followers. They don't even have social media. First of all. <laughs> so I was just like, so they're not even on there trying to show you how they made their dollar. First of all, <laughs> they got seven followers. <laughs> I mean, they're definitely not interested in teaching you. I was talking to one of. Them, I was talking to a colleague. Um, not too long ago, and they, they have a huge following. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have a whole lot of deals, and so they be kind of calling themselves, reprimanding me for not posting enough. And I was like, "Listen, I post just enough to do what I need to do. I can't do no more because mm -hmm. I'm over here working. Listen, you're gonna get what you're gonna get from me on social media. That's just what it is. I I have realized because. Listen, it's funny you say that because people used to tell me, oh, Lindsay, you got to post three times a day. I said, one thing I need you to understand, I'm actually running a real insurance business, which means I actually speak to people. I actually have applications. I got follow up. I got this. I got that. I got to deal with the insurance company. I got a lot going on. And on top of that, I'm taking time out. I'm doing mentor tour times as well. I'm teaching product. I'm doing a lot. So I cannot post three times a day. I just don't got it in me. There's going to be some times where you're not going to see me post at all for three, four days. And that's just what it's going to be. When I put a post, 
Great. You guys get the information. I want you guys to have the information. Catch it. Go back and play some old ones. Feel free. But what I can't commit to is putting up a video every single day. I can't do it. I can't do it. Because even as short as the video is, the time, the brain to just sit down for two seconds to put it together is a lot. And so I get it. When I put a video up, it does what it does. It does. It, you know, and that's great. But you're not going to get that from me every day. There's going to be a week that you don't get it at all. And I'm sorry. I'll try to put something up on the story. But I can't commit to that because I am committing to trying to train agents. I am committing to making sure my clients get what they need. I am really transitioning in my business where I'm going to lean more my my clients onto my agents and less on me so that I could do more speaking engagements and things like that. So I'm able to give the information because that's really where I want the information out there. I would like people to really understand insurance, understand creating a strong financial structure, which is not just insurance, which is estate planning, which is having a health proxy, which is having a will, a trust, which is having a long mm -hmm. care, disability, life insurance, retirement. Like these are the things that people will have part of their financial plan and not the other part and wonder why the whole thing crumbles. Because the I was going to, that, that was really what I wanted to talk about today, but we ended up starting to talk about life and business. What I want to talk about, I want you to talk about, right, like, we, I, I feel like, especially real estate people do the community a great disservice because we equate real estate with generational wealth. Jesus Christ. Say it again. <laughs> Say it again. I swear, I feel like I'm at Sarah's thing when I have my hands up the whole time. Couldn't put my hands down. But... Please say it again. If I hear another real estate person tell me that their retirement plan is their real estate, is their house that they're going to sell, is their rental income that they're going to get, I'm like, please, child, please. You know what, you know what really connected the dots for me was reading um, What Would the Rockefellers Do? Mm -hmm. That connect that like made it go off like, Oh, real estate is just a part of the generation. It's just a part of it. It's not everything. Just like life insurance is not everything. In finance in general, it's no one tool that does everything. Guess what? That's why they have so many different financial products. Because there's no one tool that does everything. Everything has pros and cons to it. And so when you layer them together, you can get your goals taken care of because there's a layer. And remember, I told you how they used to take send me across the nation for these different conferences. And we were talking about advanced planning, right? So these are going to be scenarios where people are typically going to be 5 million or above uh, in assets. And so we were doing plans for people who have multi-level incomes coming in and different things like that. And even in those plans, guess what? They had life insurance, they had real estate, they had retirement, they had 401ks, they had the health stuff covered through long-term care, disability, they had um, investments. So the plan consists of everything. It wasn't one thing because what, what the goal was, was when one thing is not doing as well, just think about your investment account. So you have your investment account, let's say you have your real estate, Let's say you have an annuity as an additional retirement account, life insurance. Let's say you have all of these things. Guess what? There's a point when your investment account is not doing well. It, that's the nature of the investment accounts. They go up and down. So when that account is going down, we're not going to be looking there to get money. We got to look somewhere else. So then we have whole life insurance. That also provides us a stability. It has cash value that we can take at any point because it's stable, because it's fixed. So in times where things are up and down, we're taking money out of there. Then we have real estate. So with our real estate side, we have some maybe rental income, some maybe properties we may be able to sell. But guess what? When the market is not a seller's market, I don't want to sell my property. I don't want to buy when it's not a buyer's market, when it's primary residence. Investment is different. 
right? The fact is based on numbers. It's not, it's not about it's buyer or sellers. But with all of these different factors, if I don't have some of everything, then when one thing is not working, I don't have no other option. So when it's not a seller's market and I'm ready to retire and I got to get the house I thought I was going to get a million for, now I can only sell it for 700000 And guess what? That cut into the equity I thought I was going to get. So now the retirement plan I thought I was going to have is not the same. No, because if we plan for retirement, if we either had an annuity that created a lifetime income for us, or maybe we had a... Uh, whole life insurance that we took out a tax-free retirement income from, or maybe we rolled over a past 401k into an investment account and we took that money out and dumped it into an immediate annuity. We could collect the tax-free, I mean, not tax-free, but we could collect the income from it. There's other options if we have all of these things. And it's such a big argument online. You know, these people will be on my page going crazy saying, I don't need whole life. I can just borrow from my bank account. Well, go ahead and borrow from your bank account. And when you die, is your bank account going to pay the death benefit too? I just want to know. Because I know that when I die, even if I took a loan out of my policy, I know when I die, my daughter's going to get that tax-free death benefit, which is not comparable to the money that I have saved in my bank account. It's not dollar for dollar. It's not the same. I posted, I did a, a whole life policy for my son right when he was born. I was I had my cracking up because I literally was trying to get the policy while he was while he was still in my stomach. <laughs> and, it was like, and that's what the cultures do. That's what they do. They're on my phone like Lindsay got a grandkid coming in about four months. Just get everything together. I'm like, it's not to get together. When you're ready, we just write it. <laughs> they're like, they're like, but we know that how much is it going to be? The baby's zero. It's going to be the same price then and now. Zero. They're zero years old. So I'll tell you what it's going to be. They be like, I just want to make sure we're going to be good. Us? Us is like, mm, I don't know if I want to get a pilot. That might make them die. I don't know. They're going to die if I get the insurance on them. Or, I don't know if I want to spend that money on them. I mean, I got 50000 myself. I don't know if I want to get it for them. I'm telling you, it's just a different mindset. And that's why I tell you, that's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book because I wanted our people to understand in layman's terms. My book has it so simplified. When people contact me after that, they're like, I understand it now, Lindsay. I got a copy. It's in my, in my, in the other room. I'm it's telling simple. you, it's very simple. I wrote the book for that so that it could be like, you could look at it like a manual. She said, term, let me go to term. Okay, term says one, two, three. Okay, I know which one I got, right? I put it like that because online, they can't put it like that because they have all of the different, you know, compliance factors of how you got to say things. So they got to use these big financial words and people are like, what, is, what the heck does that mean? So, you know, that's why, but that's also the reason why the transition to me starting to try to give more of my clients to my agents and starting to speak more, I really want to get the word out that our people understand insurance and how it could be useful, how it could be useful for retirement, how it could be useful for real estate, how it could be useful to start a business. Um, I have quite a few real estate clients, like one of my clients, he buys hotels. And we used that we set the policy up so that he was able to purchase this hotel property he was getting um, and be able to borrow the money from the policy immediately. So the money can make money while he has his money out instead of him just taking it out of his bank account. But guess what? In the midst of that, got an 11 million dollar death benefit. So if he dies his family will receive the 11 million, which is not nowhere near, I think in total, he put in 400K. So if I told you, Nicole, give me 400K and I give you your son $11 million, are you going to guarantee? Not me in my pocket, the 11 million, guarantee. Are you not going to take it? Are you going to tell me that? Oh my goodness, I don't know if I want this policy because... 
I think I could just borrow it from my own bank account and just, yeah, but if you take it from your bank account and something happens to you, your son don't get the 11 million. The building ain't worth 11 million. That's the missing piece. We got to, we, we so busy trying to figure out the wrong in it. We don't want to do it. We missing out. But you know, the, the other thing I think we're missing out on, um, one of the things that we complain about culturally, and not just black people, just people who come from, come from the mud, like you just don't come from money. Mm -hmm. We complain about how we had to come from the mud, like we had to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. And you would think that you starting from scratch would be enough trauma to make it so that you make it so that your kid doesn't start from scratch. That was traumatic for me. So this is why when my when I was nine months pregnant, I was like, can we write this policy now? Right. <laughs> like, right. I'm trying to change, I'm trying to change the trajectory of what I'm used to, of what I went through. Because guess what? We make it seem like starting off getting a head start makes life easy. It doesn't. Life's still going to be hard. Right. But at least he's got a seed. Right. Right. I will, I will say this. Um, giving them a head start just makes them be able to start at the level where other people are starting. And that's my point. The, the issue is that, I don't know, you ever watched, was it How to Get Away with Murder? No. It was Ghost 2, Power Book. And they did, they were in the classroom and they basically, they had all the students stand in one row. And this was like, a, this is considered an Ivy League school that they're in. So they asked questions um, where they said, was one of your parents in jail? Take two steps back. Was, does your parents have a job or does your parents make this or do this? They asked all of these questions that basically would show the cultural differences. So the white kids kept taking these steps forward. There was the black kids were just stepping back, stepping back. And then for certain things, they would step forward. They were saying, does your family have a trust? Does it, right? And so in the end, they said, this is how you start off compared to your peers. And one of the girls had a really bad situation. She was all the way in the back. And so by herself, this Spanish girl. And the rest of them was staggered. But of course, the white male counterparts were all the way in the front. They had the advantage. And, and they said, and that was the best way to point that out, to show you that we're not starting at the same space. They're in better schools sometimes. They, they have more access to cash. They're not having an issue with getting a loan. They already have real estate. They don't have to get the down payment to get the real estate. They have real estate. They're owning it already. So they already have things that they have life insurance. They're born into life insurance. It's not about them having it. It's about how much they got. Right. Um, and these are the different things that we don't have. They have IRAs from kids. Their parents have brought them, have paid them out of their business at young and paid into IRAs from young. So when they're an adult, they already have a million dollars saved in an the IRA. They're ahead of the curve. Remember, in retirement, our culture is so messed up. I'm telling you, people are in their 50s. They don't have $100,000 saved in the retirement accounts. And they're supposed to retire at 65 and make and have enough money for the rest of their life. No, they need, you need millions in your retirement account at 65 to have a decent salary for the rest of your life through an annuity. If you're trying to even, and, and I mean, let's just even say the salary of what they say is the average household here, only 50,000. So let's say we're saying it as low as something like that. But at 50,000, you still need at least a million or two to guarantee for the rest of your life that you get 50,000 a year and don't forget inflation. You need the inflation increase. So 
These are things that we're so far behind. You know why? Because when we get a 401k at 22 and 23, by the time we're 30, we spend all the money, we borrowed the whole thing. We get into a new job and we get a new 401k and we put the least amount of money we possibly we could put in there. They say 1%, we do 1%. And so we don't save for retirement as if in the retirement world, this money is going to fly from the sky and we're going to all of a sudden have money. No, that's why your parents is 80 years old working because social security is not enough. And that's not guaranteed for our generation. It's not guaranteed, especially for my kids' generation. So we got to do better. You know what? I'm gonna do better. You got to wrap up. I'm going to say this. Oh, yeah, because we had an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we talk about everything. I mean, but you know, this is a good conversation. See, I told you I'm gonna win you over as my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know why I've been saying this to people, even though we are, as a culture, waking up financially, we are slowly waking up. Mm -hmm. The reason why we don't do these things is because we don't know what to spend our money on. Mm -hmm. We only know what's been put in front of our faces. Mm -hmm. You give cars, Louis bags, all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the as much as we have all this information out there, people are still very ignorant. So this the whole point of me saying this is thank you to your work. You have a lot of work to do out here. Because it's not about oh, just getting up there, just to just get up there for no reason. It's to tell people, hey, there are other things to spend your money on. They get these checks. They get a 401k. They cash out that 401k. They cash the whole thing out. out. And they go and buy stupid stuff, cars, this, this, that, and the other. Not because, it's for a myriad of reasons, right? But mainly because they don't know. They don't even know how to say, I don't understand what insurance is. Mm -hmm. They don't know what to spend mm -hmm. money on. Mm -hmm. So this is why your work is so needed. Like, I could get into some personal stories about people that I know, but your work is so needed. Mm -hmm. so I, listen, I took heed. I was getting all this information from Better Than Success for years. And when I got pregnant nine months, I was like, let me get the insurance. <laughs> 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 God, so funny. I'm dead serious. I was not playing. My son was not even a month old. And I overfunded a policy that has got a short term. You actually, it's so crazy because you did a, a, a post on it today and it came up on my thing. And I was like, oh, I didn't like it. <laughs> Isn't it funny how thing come, things come together? And I was like, oh, I only pay on this thing for 15 years. Mm -hmm. That's what I tell people to do for their small kids. Why have this long pay? We could be done with it, you know. But it's you're right. There are a lot of topics, and I think we have to do it where it's digestible, where people don't feel judged. Because I think some people are also scared to talk about their situation because they're judged. Don't feel no way about talking about your finances because that's how you learn. Don't let people be looking like they laughing at you. Because I promise you, everybody has had hardships. It don't matter how much money they got now. A person who got money now could tell you a time where they lost it, where they didn't have it. Every person I know that makes millions has had a time where they had nothing. Everyone, because there's always a point where you had to learn from losing. You had to learn from losing. So it's no judgment. You need to ask questions. I get people all the time who are scared to ask because they think it's a stupid question. I'm like, no question you ask is stupid. If you don't know, you just don't know it. It's okay. That's why you want to ask because that's how you're going to learn. And of course, people, it, the information online, it's hard to know what you could believe, what you can't believe. It's, so I understand the YouTube university and is nobody's checking credits on these people that are given this information. So what you can do is check information on individuals. You can look and see my license online and how long I've been in the business. It's public. It's public. It tells you if I had an issue or didn't have an issue. It's public. Look into the people that you're paying attention to. 
check what they're saying they do. Some people say they're in real estate and they have X, Y, Z. You look in and you like, I don't see nothing. What they own? What they said they got? Um, so, you know, be careful who you listening to and who's teaching you. Let people teach you that's showing you receipts. Like they're showing you, look, this is how we're doing it. I'm doing it this way and I'm showing you this way. I'm showing you it works. Because you got people who are telling you about how they're so successful, I'm so successful, I'm so successful, but they're not teaching you how to be successful. What do you need to be successful? What are the strategies that they use that you can use that could work for you? That's what you need. You don't need people telling you about how much money they got. What is that going to do for you? I don't care if you got $20 million. I ain't got nothing to do with me. That's your money. I want to know the strategies that you used so that I can start to make my 20 million. So tell me what you did. That's why I'm here. I'm here to learn what you did. And I think that we need to learn to ask questions. It's okay to not know. It's okay to say, I made a mistake. I think I did that wrong, but let's fix our wrong. Let's correct that wrong. And you know, the betting on yourself, be smart about betting on yourself. Be prepared, be educated, and then bet on yourself, <laughs> right? Like that mindset, betting on yourself, I want you to be clear. I am not telling you to bet on yourself for something you know nothing about. Because, you know, you got to remember that when you're talking in public, it's speaking to everybody. So you take it a different way. You got to say this side and this side so that it's clear. Real clear. Yeah. But that's all. You know, thank you so much, Nicole, for having me on here. Thank you, Lindsay. This was fun. I really appreciate you. Why don't you tell everyone where they can find you and how to get in touch with you if they need some insurance? Okay. So my website is Lindsay Smith, the agent, and it's spelled right here. Lindsay Smith. So it's www.lindsaysmiththeagent. On there, you can schedule a call if you're looking for life insurance, disability, long-term care, anything, retirement planning, uh, group benefits for your companies. Also, if you guys are interested in learning more about life insurance, check my book out. It's Creating Wealth Through Life Insurance. I have a copy of it here. It's on Amazon and on my website. Um, my Instagram is at Lindsay Smith, the agent. And of course, everything is there. You can find my bio. I mean, you can find my website, the links to, to get it scheduled a call, anything, everything's on there. My free webinars, um, and check my YouTube out. And that's pretty much it. Well, thank you, Lindsay. Um, thank you for having me. See her at the Women in Real Estate Summit on November 11th. And, and wait. Yes, I can't wait. You gotta I get into conversation there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, first of all, you're going to be talking about. Um, I, I was going to do a whole question about what you want to talk about, but I already know what you're going to talk about. It doesn't even matter. You're going to be talking about <laughs> planning through real estate, like you know how to structure everything. Mm -hmm. That real estate is just a component. This is not real estate is not the legacy. It is just a component of the legacy. Mm -hmm. So, um, Lindsay's going to be talking to you guys about that, okay? And I need everybody, if you can, get up in her session, okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Everyone, get your ticket at women or wiresummit 2023com And Lindsay, this was awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you, and I can't wait to spend time with you. Yes, thank you for having me. See you guys at the Wire Summit. <laughs>